Hmm. All right, Johnny, you ready? Another episode of the future of data. Uh, ready, of course. <laughs> Oops, I think I'm supposed to start this with uh, no screen share so that the audience can can see our, our lovely, beautiful faces over here. And then I get to jump into today's topic, which is going to be decentralized AI. So a very, very broad topic here. And we had thought about using even different terms in decentralized AI, uh, you know, how to go and have verifiable AI, um, AI that's utilizing Web3 in some kind of way. I'll say this, you know, I think uh, our, our motivation for doing this uh, specific term was based off of the Augment Hackathon that uh, we're really excited about over in Paris in two weeks. So this hackathon is going to be focused on how to go and have um, AI that is uh, a little bit more inclusive, a little bit more secure and, and privacy preserving. Uh, full disclosure, we are uh, a sponsor of this hackathon. So please reach out if you're curious to go and see how to use uh, WeaveChain to, to win some uh, bounty money. Uh, in, in this uh, methodology, but uh, I will also admit that I had to reach out to the organizers uh, over at, at uh, in Inflection and, and ask if we could also hack <laughs> because we're so excited to build stuff in this space right now. And, and you know, th this is an opportunity for us to not just sort of allow people to use WeaveChain to go and do something cool, but actually to uh, augment WeaveChain to go and achieve something um, even, even more special. So, we put together a really lightweight agenda today um, to just talk about uh, a few of the interesting things that we're seeing in this decentralized AI space. Um, but I actually want to start over here at the top with um, the key tracks and topics for uh, the hackathon. You know, what sort of the industry is seeing as key themes that they want to see happening right now with AI. Obviously, uh, large language models and, and chat bots are... are all the rage right now uh, after the uh, emergence of, of ChatGPT and, and other players. But there are some challenges associated with, um, you know, the establishment of these AI models that we've discussed in the past on previous episodes. I think uh, on the first episode over here, we talked about the EU's AI Act and how people are starting to become aware that, let's say, these AI are being trained on data that may have uh, security properties that or even privacy properties that, that may make it inappropriate. So the EU AI Act is uh, explicitly making it so that these foundational models like OpenAI's uh, and even Google's BARD and, and such have to declare whether or not they've used copyrighted material in their training. They do not, have, however, have to you know declare whether personal data has been used in their training. And I'll, I'll mention that this EU AI Act hasn't even passed yet, right? It's still uh, being applied. Right now, there are effectively no uh, regulations uh, on the, the training of data, though recently we have seen a few lawsuits pop up that are starting to uh, establish that legal precedent. So the owners of ChatGPT are currently under two lawsuits right now um, over copyright infringement and privacy violations. And the sort of simpler one to understand is the, the, the copyright uh, issue. So over here, um, the writers of a few science fiction books went and created a lawsuit uh, claiming that ChatGPT uh, was trained on the text of their books uh, without permission. So uh, these are the authors of some sci-fi books and horror books. And, you know, if you go and ask ChatGPT to go and summarize the books, uh, ChatGPT can accurately do so. And the only way it would be able to do so is if it actually understood the text of the book. Now, what they think is that ChatGPT went and um, trained its model on two data sets of books that were actually uh, illegal, right? Um, now, obviously, this is all just uh, allegations at this point. We don't know what, what's happening over here, but it's going to be really interesting to see whether or not um, that was actually the case, whether ChatGPT just went and sucked up data from all over, you know, the regulated internet and the dark web to get to go into its training and whether there will be a way for, um, you know, the claimants to prove this and whether, um, you know, what, what would happen if, if open AI loses the lawsuit and it turns out that they were, um, you know, infringing on copyrights here, would they have to go and pay some percentage of revenue um, to the, the owners of these books or would they have to go and, you know, establish some, something to, to show that they, they did this training. Now, the second allegation that came against ChatGPT was uh, what was the data that was actually used to go and, and train GPT and, and was it actually uh, private data? So the allegation here was that, um, you know, services like Snapchat, Spotify, Stripe, Slack, and Microsoft Teams 
have integrated with OpenAI. And the trick there is that, you know, there's a chance that OpenAI was actually training its model with data from these services. And if it did so, then OpenAI would have created a breach of the terms of service of Spotify, for example, um, you know, without Spotify users understanding it. So it's saying that, you know, if uh, people realize that I sit around listening to musicals all the time uh, and OpenAI has figured this out, maybe it's going to go and be able to learn something about my preferences, even though uh, that wouldn't be possible under the terms of service that I signed with, with Spotify. So it's gonna be really interesting to see that. But it, we, we go back to um, you know this this decentralized AI concept over here, and a, a lot of the um, you know bits over here are like you know how can we go and ensure privacy for for users um, when data is being used to train these models? How can we go and ensure that like the the data that's being used is notarized so that we know whether or not something was used that is copyrighted material in the training of the model? And how do we know that, like, you know, something that was generated by the AI was generated by an AI or a person and, and so forth. The other bits here are like, you know, on the value capture side of things. Well, what if the authors of these books were willing to say, oh, yeah, I would love for AI to be able to go and do um, summaries of my book. That'd be great. You know, I just want to go and get a cut of those profits. I want to go and make sure that if somebody is going to be leveraging my um, my work, and benefiting from it, that I will be part of that that value chain. We come over to the uh, last two two bits over here, governance and alignment. This is um, how can we go and enable, you know, if if really is our data that's being used to train these models, how can we go and ensure that we are stakeholders in it to make sure that these models are being used for good purposes? For example, you know, if you're the writer of a sci-fi book that's talking about uh, Armageddon. You, you may not want to know that the AI has figured out how to go and find the flaws in your plan so that somebody could go and execute a terrorist attack based off your vision or something like that. Uh, these are things where, you know, again, we want to make sure that we are stakeholders in, in what's being built over here. And then ideally, you know, expand uh, the availability uh, of these things. How can we go and make it so that the training can happen across more diverse data sets and, and even using more diverse models? So I'll come back over here to um, how we are approaching it. And um, you know, we'll sort of jump in here into some of the techniques that we have been designing here at WeChain that we think uh, can go and establish, you know, our, our, our headline here is like, how do you go and create a verifiable AI training lineage? And it's more towards the, uh, let's say, lawsuit angle over here and the le legislation that's coming through the EU to go and say, if you are open AI, how do I go and prove that I, you know, train this data off of valid sources and that, um, you know, anybody that comes to me with, with a kind of lawsuit in the future would, would be uh, addressed really quickly. Um, what do you think, Johnny? Should we go through the, the pipeline and, and, you know, touch base on our uh, notarization first and then go into our computational lineage? Let's try to go through. Maybe first we should describe what are the ways to uh, ensure the provenance of the data and then go to the lineage. Okay, so that's the provenance of the data is like, where has it come from a verifiable source? Yeah. yeah. I could use our slide on accountable for this. It's like the verifiability of data, right? Let me see if I have that over in our deck. Ah, I love opportunities to go and add some, some more of our fun slides to the deck. So, you know, we're building a, a product with a uh, weave chain called accountable for verifiable financial data. And one of the things that we've been trying to figure out is how do we go and uh, make it so that we can prove that data is coming from a verifiable source. So let me just go and get this. Where is my deck over here? There you are. So I'm gonna talk about this in terms of financial data. But it applies to uh, you know any any data set uh, just just as well. The idea is if I go and tell you something, like I have two million dollars uh, in my wallet, it is very easy to go and lie about that. You know, I could have two dollars or I could have twenty million dollars. It's just a claim. One step higher than that is if I go and provide you with some documentation. So very off chain, non digital. 
I could go and give you like a printout of my bank statement and say, oh, look, here it is. Well, it's like very easy to fake that stuff. In auditing processes, a lot of times um, you'll go and say, I'm going to go and have my bank statement um, emailed to me on a monthly basis and I will CC my auditor or creditor um, from the bank so that you at least see that the uh, email came from Bank of America, whoever it is. But again, these things can be spoofed. A little bit better than that is if you have an API uh, coming in with that data, and I would actually share that API with another party. So, you know, in that case, it wouldn't be me sharing my data with uh, you. It would be me giving you access to my bank and then you going in and verifying with my bank. Now, APIs can still be spoofed, right? Like uh, it's possible to do a man-in-the-middle attack, give a fake API endpoint, all these kind of things. A little bit better is if we have an API with a verifiable lineage that uses uh, secure enclave technology to go and say, we have locked down this process that knows how to do an API to Coinbase, and we can go and prove that it has not been hacked. And one step better than that is actually if you sign the data from the API. So the way your browser works is that it's actually going and checking this uh, certificate that was signed um, you know, by the provider of the website, you know, docs.google.com in the scenario. We're just using public key cryptography to go and validate that in real time. And the end result is I have this nice lock icon over here that's there all the time. And, you know, in Web3, everything's happening with signed activity all the time. So, you know, your MetaMask wallet is going and signing activity over here. And what we say for verifiable financial data is that, you know, it's not going to go from unverifiable to verifiable overnight. It's a spectrum. And, and your goal is to go and get as much of this data as verifiable as possible and, and to sort of be aware of that. Now, Johnny, when it comes to like, you know, training an AI, how would you go and sort of like notarize the authenticity of uh, various data sources for, for AI training? So it's uh, the same spectrum. Ideally, you uh, you get all people to sign from the source, but uh, obviously it will not be possible to have a thing sign from the source. So there will be parties that sign on behalf of others and there will be probably even mm -hmm. there will be also consensus of signers to, to attribute to a certain source. Uh, I don't know exactly how this will uh, happen over time, but I'm sure that it will happen. There will uh, be a, I mean, in the near future, we will have uh, repositories of signed data mm -hmm. and trust data that uh, will be used. I mean, there are already open data sets that are used uh, to train AI models. Uh, ImageNet started long time ago and there are many others um this is the uh, image data that's used to train uh what was it like if you can predict the next number or what number an image is showing or something many others um <laughs> <laughs> uh, starting from alexnet a long time ago so uh um data databases of uh data sets are not a new invention uh what i think will happen in the future and also Web3 will have a contribution to that is to have uh, signed data sets and also distributed private data sets, which is uh, having uh, not just the signed uh, data, also uh, having uh, the possibility to restrict access to wh whom you, you let to train on your data and uh, mm -hmm. actually yeah, and it's a longer story. The there is also the monetization part, which I assume. Yeah, I see you also. You already mentioned mm -hmm. the monetization. Should have the right to decide whether their data is used for training. Yeah, this is a big one that I'm I'm really excited about. You know, I think unfortunately, the way that OpenAI went and trained its models was probably just to scrape everything that was available on the internet. And we actually saw over the past week that, um, well, let's say over the past few months, we've seen a lot of services restricting their APIs so that that's not possible. So, you know, Reddit um, recently got into a lot of uh, trouble because they went and made it so that their API is, uh, you know, restricted so that because, you know, AI, we're, we're learning off of what was happening on, on uh, Reddit for, uh, for free effectively and taking advantage of the content that users are creating. They're not the first to do this. Um, Twitter um, recently increased pricing for its API, um, and you know also got into a, a bit of, of trouble with the community for it. But it was for precisely the service, and 
more recently, Twitter started establishing uh, read limits um, for exactly the same purpose. It, it knew that AI was going into Twitter and reading everything that was happening and using it to train models so that it could go and, you know, be more believable as coming from uh, a specific person or source or a reputable party. And that's scary. You know, it's not like uh, our, our Weave Chain account is compensated for any of the tweets that we're putting out there around thought leadership in, uh, you know, the future of data or anything like that. So this ability to go in and, and choose whether or not to do it is critical. And then we'll, we'll talk about the payments again in a second. But Johnny, maybe if I get to ask you just one, one more thing, um, how do you do this like notarization of sources from like uh, devices or, or things in the, in the real world? Uh, devices can have uh, unique IDs and they can sign. So it's uh, something that it's already solved and there are many identity providers on IoT, including our friends from security. That's right. So the, the key idea here is that what you're going to go and make it so that every device has an ID and then are they signing the data as it comes from those devices or? Yes. So they have a, a unique ID and there's also signing of the data. This is awesome. Uh, and so the key thing here is that you can go and prove that this data came from this sensor or this wearable. Exactly. And then, you know, when you're going in and training your AI off of it, then I could say, um, uh, I, I know that this is valid data that, that was used for it. Now, how would you then include that into our computational lineage? Uh, it, it, it's the same process that we had before, right? It's exactly the same process that we can run on any task. Also, when you train a model, it's the same process. Uh, you have the signatures of the source data, then you can hash this together. Uh, you have the computational task. Everything uh, runs and produces an output that uh, at its turn it's hashed again, and you can uh, sign this chain of hashes. Basically, you, you tie tie all together with a signature at the end. So let's just write through this, you know, flow of verifiable AI training page. One is uh, collect data from a verifiable source. So this is establish a unique ID or DID for the source. Have that source sign the data packet yeah. before, before sending. Usually hash and sign the hash to make it feasible. Hash the data, the packet sign the hash and then what some sort of consent uh, to use the data in training. So uh, then, I the yeah, I see the consent separate, but uh, yeah, it's part of the flow. Sure. And then over here we have uh, training the AI using uh, consented verifiable data. So this is, uh, you know, establish a corpus of data, hash it, sign it, create that timestamp or that record. Yep. That's general blockchain. Anchors. Then we go and um, create uh, the AI training uh code hash it <laughs> sign it <laughs> create the record potentially in the blockchain well, the, the signature can happen at the end so you, you only hash it and you sign the the chain of hashes so you sign everything at the end uh, together together with the timestamp so you also have a point of time and you can vouch that this input data with this computer task is producing this i see i see so at the moment right so train model on data. The problem is uh, that later somebody will have to, I mean, uh, having a signature does not mean anything unless you are able to verify the signature. So you, yep. you could verify the signature, but still you have to trust the hashes that uh, enter the computation. I mean, the hashes. Of or the, have a copy of the data, right? Yeah. 
So, and that's having a copy of the data is one of the ways to, uh, let's say, to, uh, to verify a hash. So you, you trust the signature, that's the first step, and then you have to trust the hashes. And one way is to have the data to replicate the hash, to have the model open sourced so you can replicate the hash, and so on. Or you uh, have the hash compute in a ZK manner. That's another way. Oh my gosh, I get the ability to pull up more slideware. Um, we call these trust networks, right? Um, you know, for everything that you hear about zero knowledge proofs and stuff like that, I think one of the uh, little known secrets is for them to be useful, you still need to have somebody that can go and, and see the data to, to validate your proofs. Or a hash um, of data. So that's the, right. The, or a trusted hash of data or something. Mm -hmm. You need to, to have something about the input. Yeah, you got it. So in our verifiable financial data scenario for Accountable, we have, you know, a hedge fund, uh, a investor and a fund administrator. The fund administrator is still important to ensure that the hedge fund has included all their accounts over here, but they also need raw access to be able to validate the zero knowledge proofs and hashes uh, of the data. Yeah, you know, if we're gonna go and make these uh, cosine attestations to investors over here. So there needs to be three parties, right? If you just have two parties and one's trying to prove something to the other without showing the data, it's just, it's never gonna work. There are still some uh, use cases here. So you could have a, a, a hash and a signature and you could also ZK proof. So you, anything, you, you can have a proof of something and uh, you cannot validate it, but you have the proof and uh, at, at a later moment in time, an auditor mm -hmm. comes in and they can uh, verify the state uh, that, so th uh, they can verify that the model is indeed as claimed given the access to data post hoc. And yet yeah. another use case is that uh, you can compute, you can do everything in the secure enclave, which gives you uh, control that uh, of, of the whole process. So uh, also secure enclaves can enter the scene a bit here. But I think we, we went a bit too far with this. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the idea is you're saying if we went and put all those hashes on chain ahead of time and you know a lawsuit came where there was a claim of fraud, Exactly. You wouldn't actually have to have the copy of the data until this moment where, where the lawyers get involved and then somebody's gonna have to go and see the root, root stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And the fact that you were you were willing to yeah. put that hash uh, is already showing something. Yeah, exactly. Look, that might be what happens in this open AI lawsuit over here, right? Like they're gonna have to go and prove that they did not train open AI with these alleged illegal data sets. I'm very, I'm very curious to see how they're going to do it, but uh, you know, a way that OpenAI could have done it is if they had uh, done this exact methodology, they could have put these hashes on chain, and then now during the lawsuit, just go and compare those hashes against their data and say, "Look, everything matches. We've kept this record. You know, everything everything's kosher over here." Johnny, uh, I know we're running low on time. Um, I want to talk through locality sensitive hashing. I just want to talk through payments and validating um, user data inclusion. What, what, what's your favorite of these? Uh, well, uh, we should probably, we should mention first that uh, checking ownership of the data is an important thing here. So it's not just the lineage of the model. You should also be able to check if your copyrighted data, for example, was or not, uh, was included in the training or not. Yep. This is an important thing. And uh, obviously uh, the same uh, methodology that is applied for proof of reserves be it with hashes, Merkle trees, or with uh, KZG commitments, or with ZK proofs, or whatever. So th the same methodology can be used also in this case. And the idea is to be able to, uh, so to have a hash of your data and verify if that hash is uh, represented in the, the, the. Actually, it's easier to understand with the Merkle trees. Uh, so if uh, the during the training process, there is also a Merkle tree that is built out of the data, and the uh, uh, root hash is published. That's a proof. It's a good enough proof for somebody to testify for the data that was used during the training. Now, if the owner of the model is also making the Merkle tree available, mm -hmm. anyone can check uh, first that the root hash is matching with uh, one advertised on the blockchain and that, uh, verify if their data was included or not. And there is a small problem here the fact, by the fact that uh, uh, you need, when you do any hash or cryptographic hash, like hash or hitchhike or whatever, uh, any change, so one bit 
uh, changed mm. in the uh, industry. Let, let's hold, hold, hold that thought for just one second. I, I want to jump to Lucali's Luc sense of hashing, but first, what you were talking about, about checking whether my data was used in the training data set is very similar to what Binance has done with its proof of reserves, which is saying, I, as a user, want to know that my balance at Binance is included in a portfolio that Binance has shown is over collateralized to show that they have more assets than they have outstanding li liabilities. And the way that that works is that Binance is going once a month and creating a Merkle tree where they will put the Merkle root hash out in the public domain. I, you can go and switch this over time and see these out here. I'm sure, you know, the, the way back machine is uh, making sure that the, these are, are not being tampered with. We suggest people put these on the blockchain. Regardless, somebody can go over here and uh, go and take their leaf, right? Their individual user account balance hash, and then download the Merkle tree, and then use open source code to go and validate that their position is part of this overall portfolio. And what you're saying over here is that the same thing could happen with AI training, where somebody could go and have their personal data and go to one of these purveyors of an AI model and say, I want to check if my data was used in training your model and we should be able to get a check. Is that correct? Yeah. Sweet. And um, this, uh, the, the exact same pattern we work for, for example, on DNA data like models like hyena DNA or whatever. So uh, DNA data is, uh, um, yeah, will not be changed uh, during training. So you don't do not mm -hmm. alter it before injury. You do not pre-process it or in, in like to alter it uh, in, uh, in one way or another. So uh, the, uh, this type of uh, input data will be hashed uh, traditionally. And uh, obviously you will match the hash if it was used or, or not. Uh, but there are a lot of problems when you use text data or image data. With the mm -hmm. image data, for example, if you just resize the image, uh, the hash of the resized image will be totally different. That's why you need to compute some uh, invariance out of the image. So, or for the text data, uh, again, you remove some words, you remove spaces, and the, you know, spaces, uh, some punctuation marks, and you have a totally different uh, hash. And uh, there are, well, there are many challenges here. It's not, there's no perfect solution, but one of the possibilities is to uh, first to do some locality sensitive hashing on text and then hash the uh, hash that in the macro tree. Mm -hmm. Obviously there is no, I mean, it's a larger discussion. This is just a food thought. And the, uh, I believe that there will be uh, more research in this area and people will find ways to build the equivalent of macro trees out of content. Also locality sensitive hashing has its issues. So it's not, Completely, yeah, but uh, uh, so the idea is that in the Binance Proof of Reserves example we had over here, this is a very concrete number. It is account number, balance number, creates the same hash every time. If instead I took this paragraph of text or let's say I, I had a blog post, right? I, I go over to Medium and let's see here. Where's our WeChain accounts? Uh, sorry, my email. Uh, shucks, not handy. Uh, medium, we've changed. So we had this lovely article that we did on uh, the history and future of crypto regulation. And let's say that we published this on May 2nd. And, you know, here is the, the body of the text. Then we go and publish a new version on June 9th. And suddenly we add a few periods or add a new link to the thing. If we train the AI on the original version from May 2nd, and we tried to use the updated version from June 9th to go and check whether it was included in the AI, it would fail because they're different things, right? It can't tell between the, the two. But if we use the locality sense of hashing and all we've done was change one period, there's a greater chance that, uh, let's say, both versions would create the same locality sensitive hash, and then the match would have been successful. We see. So uh, I just say that, that uh, in the next year or two, we will see this uh, expanding. I mean, 
you can use embeddings or build in a certain way. Maybe there will be the equivalent of Merkle trees built on text data somehow in a smarter way, such that the Merkle trees are not needed and so on. And these things are starting to materialize in websites like Have I Been Trained, where I can go and input uh, some text or upload uh, you know, my headshot and see whether or not that headshot has been used in um, you know, the training of AI models. These services are still very, very early. I actually didn't even understand how to <laughs> use this product uh, fully, but the concept here of you know, have I been trained is an interesting one. Same for, you know, spawning, I think, is doing it for, for some APIs over here. And hopefully we get to go and, and build something cool around this um, for, for that hackathon. Well, like the last bit I'll say over here is, um, you know, for Augment Hack, they, they really want to go and understand, like, how does the value capture chain work? And, you know, at, at WeChain, we, we are like fervent believers that the future of data um, does have people getting compensated right all, all data is an economic asset and, and we want people to be compensated for those assets and let's say that there's two types of, of uh, approaches that you could do the first is say that i will give you my data and but you have to pay me a, a fixed amount ahead of time so say ai you can use my article on crypto regulation for 10 bucks the alternative model is to say i want to go and be paid when your model is used so if somebody creates you know the crypto regulation chatbot, and they use our article for it. Well, if they're going to go and charge people, um, you know, a dollar per query, I want to get one cent per query or something like that. Both of these are very, very tricky to do in a fiat world where data is being passed around, uh, you know, via Stripe payments and things like that. It should be a lot easier in a token-driven world where you know, digital money is being used to passing between parties. So we're, we're hopeful that at this hackathon, we should be able to showcase at least one of these methods for compensating users for their data that's used for this AI training. Well, Johnny, I promised you I was going to let you go 15 minutes ago, and uh, the conversation was just too good. So uh, th thank you for jumping on. It's a, a big topic over here, but uh, I'm pretty confident we're going to see a lot more of this uh, materialize as uh, AI becomes more and more commonplace in our lives, and I'm, I'm excited to be on the forefront of it. But uh, th thanks as always, and uh, please shout out in, in the chat if there are certain topics that you want us to cover. Thanks, Johnny. See you, everybody. Bye.